All right, let's get started. We have a very special guest today. I'm not talking about me. Uh, Marty, <laughs> Marty, that's so funny. Uh, Marty brought Abby with him today. He's, yeah. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's dog sitting for the day. Um, yeah, Abby's adorable. I'm going to call on her all the time, so you guys don't have to worry about questions. <laughs> She's very cute. Anyway, so you can come say hi to Abby after lecture if you want. Um, so uh, Marty gets the day off. He's dog sitting, obviously, over there in a the corner. So um, today we're going to talk about a really cool topic, which is array lists. Um, so array lists are another new variable type that we're going to be introduced to. Uh, apparently, Abby is not a fan of array lists. I asked her this morning. Marty said that she's not, which is kind of sad. <laughs> she doesn't care. It's okay. Um, anyway, so uh, cool topic today. Um, before we get started, are there any administrative or logistical questions about anything? Anything? It's Friday. Frost is this weekend. Anyone, go, anyone going to Frost? Yeah, only a couple people. Oh, okay. All right, so let's jump right in. So uh, learning goals for today, there's only one. <laughs> Um, which is knowing how to store and retrieve data in an array list. And you might ask what an array list is, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But to give you kind of a sneak peek for what we're going to get to by the end of today, we're going to be able to write two super, super cool programs. Um, one is kind of a day planner program that helps you reorder tasks in the order you want to complete them. And the other is a awesome, awesome emulation of the opening Star Wars crawl, like text going up the screen, if you guys know what I'm talking about there. So that's pretty cool. Two things that you couldn't have done before, but once you get to array lists, you'll see that they're not so bad. All right, so kind of a quick plan for today. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, a quick review of arrays because arrays and array lists have a lot in common. Then we're gonna jump into talking about array lists. We're gonna go through a couple examples and then we're gonna step back a little bit and talk about a compare and contrast between arrays and array lists because they do have a lot of similarities. If we have time, we'll get to the, you know, we'll code up opening crawl ourselves. Otherwise, we'll just do a quick walkthrough of it and then we'll kind of close off with a quick recap. All right, so jumping right into arrays. So hopefully you guys are pretty familiar with arrays. Um, hashtag Melody Maker image algorithms, like listening to happy birthday, like 10 octaves up. Did anyone try that? <laughs> to, to test your hearing loss is just like, how high can you go? Um, so hopefully you're pretty familiar with arrays. But just to kind of review and recap um, in preparation for moving to array list, as we said before, an array just is a variable type that represents a list of items. You access those items by a particular index in the array. So you can have many things in the array. You access which element in the array you want by index. And then you can store any single type of item in an array. So we say that arrays are homogenous because they, once you say what it stores, it can only store that one type of thing. But it can store anything you want, ints, doubles, T-Rex, whatever. And we saw a um, pretty cool program that Ashley showed. If you remember back when Ashley lectured on arrays, uh, we saw this pretty cool program, and I'm actually, actually going to jump back to um, Eclipse and run it. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, jump to Eclipse. Okay, so um, I'm going to just run her big game program that we saw earlier, big game. And if you remember what it did at the beginning, if I can make this a little bit bigger, um, is it asked for how many years of big game you wanted to enter, right? It, it tabulated kind of the, the margin of winning or losing uh, over different big games across the years. So we would say like five, and then it would ask like year one's margin is, you know, 20, you know, 12, maybe you lost the next year, sad times. Um, these are not very good football numbers, by the way. 20 and 12 are kind of bizarre, but whatever. Um, you know, maybe three, and then uh, seven. And then it tells you like all the game margins. It tells you some cool stats and things like that. But if you notice, one of the limitations of this is that you have to tell the program how many years you're gonna enter before you start. So you have to say like, I'm, you know, just as like FYI, I'm gonna enter five numbers and then it asks you for those five numbers. So it's kind of static. It has to know how many numbers you're gonna enter in advance. And the reason for that is that, if I jump back to the game, the reason is that when we store the scores, we have to create an array and that is done down here where we say, how many years of big game do you want? And then we make a new array of that size, right? So this is highlighting one of the limitations that we bumped into a little bit with arrays, is that arrays are static size. You have to say the size when you create it. And once you create it, you can't change it. So if, this, if the user actually wants to enter four scores instead of five, then you know, it's not really very easy to do that because the array has been allocated to size five. So that's one of the limitations. The other one, and I'm gonna 
jump back. I'm trying to use this screen recording thing, which is kind of cool, but kind of not. So I'm going to jump back here. The people watching online will thank me later. OK, so um, one of the limitations that we talk about is that size must be specified upon creation. You can't add or remove or insert elements after the fact. And there are also no handy methods for searching if an array contains an element. You saw that if you even want to print out an array, you have to use arrays dot to string, right? To, you know, which is this special weird method that you have to call to print out an array. So an array doesn't do a lot of stuff for you. It's kind of a lot of manual labor. So there are a couple limitations. And these limitations are exactly the kind of things that array lists solve for us. So transitioning to array lists. Array lists are exactly the same as arrays in that they're a variable type that represents a list of items. You can access individual items in an array list, or I guess this should say array list, by index, right? So you access them by index. And it stores a single type of object. And you'll notice the word object is bolded. We'll get to that a little bit later about that as one of the limitations of array lists. So there's really no perfect world here. But you store a single type of thing, just like for arrays. But here's where it gets cool. They're resizable. Like, oh, I, you're, I'm not I'm the only one who thinks that's kind of cool. So <laughs> I've just gotten really into array lists. So that's so cool. So they're resizable. You can add and remove things from them. It's awesome. It's like being liberated from the shackles of arrays where you have to specify a fixed size. So they're resizable. You can add or remove elements. You can move elements around. You can insert elements in the middle, and it'll expand. It's pretty cool. And we'll do some examples in a little bit. And on top of that, array lists have some helpful methods for searching through an array list, seeing what's in it, um, you know, manipulating them in different ways. So there are all these cool methods you can call on array lists, just like you've gotten used to calling on GREX, GOVILS, things like that. So without further ado, let's talk about our first array list. So this is how you make a variable that is an array list. You say array list string my array list equals new array list string. One caveat is you have to import Java util star to get access to this nifty stuff. So I'll use that as a little asterisk up there. So what's going on here? So the first thing is, obviously, you have to say that you're making an array list. So that's our type. Now, there's this weird angle bracket thing after the word array list. And this is the type of items your array list will store. So just like for an array where you have to specify the type in advance, you have to specify the type for an array list in advance as well. But the syntax is just a little bit different. Instead of saying type bracket bracket, you say array list and then put the type inside these angle brackets. So that's the type. You name your variable whatever you want. In this case, my array list. And then you have the same syntax you're used to for making new objects, which is you say equals new array list. And then you have to match the type on the other side as well, followed by parentheses. Okay, so you have to match both sides. Now, one caveat about this, is this is how the book does it. There's also an alternative form, which is just as it's equivalently functional, where you don't have to put the type on the right side. You can just put the type on the left side. So it'll just say new array list, parentheses, parentheses. Either way is equivalent. The book does it this way. Um, but that's a newer standard that you can also use as well. So they're both equivalent. OK, so that's how we make an array list. And you're like, all right, well, that's kind of cool. But what can we do with it? So when you make a new array list, because it's resizable, you notice that we don't specify a size when you create one. So the size initially starts off empty. It's zero. Right? It's totally empty. It's ready. It's like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to add elements. Now, you'll notice if you make an array that's size zero, it's just like, I'm not very useful because you can't add anything to me. So unlike that, this is pretty useful here because we can add stuff later. So we make a new array list, empty. And then if we want to add an element, we use this add method on an array list. So in this case, we're using strings. So if we just say list.add hello. This will add an element to the back. So add appends an element to the back of the array list. In this case, it's empty. So it just that's what the array list is now. So now it's size one. If we do it again, now it's size two. And that's how you add elements. If you want to get elements out of an array list, it's very similar to how you're used to getting things out of an array, which is you get things by index, except you don't use the square brackets like you do for arrays. You use the dot get method. So if you say list.get0, that's going to give us back hello. And if you say list.get1, it's going to give us back there. Okay, So it's a little bit more verbose syntax versus arrays. But you can do some pretty cool things with this. OK. What questions do you have about array lists so far? I have, can I have better candy this time. I've also been eating it this morning, so, which is not good. Yes, question. So I think array lists why 
So the question is, if array lists are like array lists seem really cool, why do we even have to deal with arrays? We'll actually get to that later on um, when we discuss the pros and cons of arrays and array lists. There is no perfect solution. There are um, drawbacks to array lists that arrays solve as well. Yeah, I'm not going to try throwing up there. You can come after class. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, can you specify the position you want to add it at? Oh, that was okay. At least they're bigger so you can see them coming faster. <laughs> okay, so uh, the question is, can you specify what index you want to add it at? Absolutely. There is a method um, called add where you specify the index and the item as well. Um, we'll get to that in a future slide, but yes, that is absolutely possible. And it'll just splice it in the middle. Other questions? Okay, so there are a couple other things we can do with array lists that are similar to what we've been able to do with arrays. The first is you can use a for loop to print them out, just like you've done with arrays. So instead of printing out zero and one manually, you can replace that with a for loop that just loops over from i equals zero up to list.size. You'll notice that this syntax is slightly different than for arrays. Arrays were dot length with no parentheses. This is dot size with parentheses. And you can do the same thing you otherwise did where we say print len list.get i. So that's how you loop through the entire array list and print it out. There's also this cool nifty syntax you can use called a for each loop, where if you just want to iterate over all the, all the items in an array and you don't care, you don't really care about i, you don't really need to use i in your loop, you can use this syntax, which is, I'm going to use my handy lightsaber, which is really short, but whatever. You say for string stir, so you, have, you make a variable called stir in list. That's how you read it, for string stir in list print stir. So what this will do is it will make stir equal to every element in list one after the other. And you can do whatever you want with each element inside that for loop. So it's basically the same as using this for loop and making a string called stir that's equal to list.getI and then doing something with that. So it's just shorthand syntax if you want that. Okay. Yes, question. Um, do you ever put anything in parentheses when you create or initialize a list? Um, Marty, are there ways you can initialize a list besides the default? Yeah, so the short answer is it's pretty empty in terms of, uh, in terms of what you pass in. The benefit of arrays, array lists is that they're expandable, so you can specify what you need later. But that is actually one of the drawbacks, is if you know what you want ahead of time, maybe an array is a better option. Okay, so a couple drawbacks or things that you should not do with array lists. So if we make a new array list and you're like, actually, you know what, I had second thoughts. I want to put a G label in my array list. The array list is like, uh-uh, can't do that. So just like for arrays, you can't put things in with the wrong type. Once you specify the type that the array list will store, you have to put things in only of that type. So this won't work. The other thing, just like for arrays, is you can't get things that are not valid indices. So you have to be careful just like for arrays. How many people ran into index out of bounds exceptions when working with arrays? A lot of people, yeah. So you all know this pretty well. So just be careful. Everyone's like, oh. Yeah, so just be careful with your indices. Um, just like for uh, arrays, array lists are pretty, uh, pretty persnickety about giving you valid indices back. So something to watch out for. Okay, so that's kind of the first intro of array lists. Any questions before we move on into our first example? Yes, question in the back. Can you do two or three dimensional array lists? Yes, you can. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we compare arrays and array lists. The short answer is that it's a bit easier for arrays because arrays you specify the size. And so if you want to make something like a matrix, which is a two dimensional array, it's a little bit harder with an array list because you have to build it up manually and you might have different sizes going on. So it's a little bit weirder with array lists than for arrays. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Other questions before we chug forward? OK, so first example I want to give you guys a taste to give you guys a taste of array list is this example called reversible writing. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but there are I was like scouring the internet last night instead of preparing for lecture, which is like, you know, normal. But I was preparing for lecture, so it kind of counts. There are all these cool stories that people have posted online where you can read it front like start to end and then you read it end to start and they're two completely different stories but they both make sense which is like pretty cool so as kind of a little snippet that i pulled you guys are like this is really boring but it's cool trust me so like if you read this this seems pretty down like i am not a person who contributes and i refuse to believe that i will be useful and if you flip the sentences and the lines 
says, I will be useful and I refuse to believe that I am not a person who contributes. So it's kind of cool, right? It's kind of, you know, if you're like, why'd you start off with the bad one and then go to the good one? But you know, the second one's kind of motivational. So there are these really cool things that people have posted these stories online where you flip the order of the lines and you read the lines from back to front and front to back and they're two completely different stories. And it's pretty cool. I, like, I, I tried writing this and I ended up, I was like, I can't even write a three line one so I copied and pasted this one in as an example. They're hard to write. Anyway, so what I wanna do is our first array list example is to write a program that reverses a text file. So we wanna give it a story that's in one order and we want it to reverse the story and print it out in the reverse order so that we can read it in the reverse order. Okay, so how can an array list help us here? Who wants to get us started with any thoughts on how an array list might help? Yes. Okay, so the suggestion is maybe we can store all the lines in the file in an array list as strings. That's pretty good. Oh. So we could store all the lines in an array list. Now, why do we need to do that? If we don't use array lists, how would we originally approach this problem? So I heard scanner somewhere. So yeah, we can use a scanner, but what's the problem with using a scanner and iterating over every line in the file? How do we reverse it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of confusing because you like you have to store the last one and print that out first and you might have to use like multiple scanners or maybe you have to store it some other way. So it gets kind of messy really quick because you can't, scanners can't go backwards, right? You wish scanners could go backwards, but they can't. They have to go from start to finish. So maybe an array list can help us by, like you said, storing every line individually in the array list. So if we store every line in an array list, how do we then reverse the file and print it out in reverse? Any thoughts? for a dark chocolate Hershey's. Yeah. Okay, we can use a backwards for loop. Yeah, that's one way. There's another way we could do it too. Any other ideas? Oh, that's too short. <laughs> Any other suggestions? So we could iterate backwards using a for loop. What else can we do? Think about how we might build up our array list as we're reading in the file. This is for a off-brand crunch bar. You know, they make their own, like, it's called crackle, and it's like, it's a sad excuse for a crunch bar, but whatever, it still tastes okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can switch the order. As a for two projectile, yeah, I'll switch you in the head, there you go, okay. So, goal not kill anybody today. So, you could add it in reverse order. So maybe when you read the first line, Right, you add it to the back, and then you read the second line, and then you add it in front of that, and then in front of that, and then in front of that, so that way you reverse the array list in place, and then you can print out the array list in order. So those are two equivalent solutions to this problem. So to walk through, we're gonna go with the first solution just because it's easier to walk through. If we wanted to write a program that reverses a file, the first thing we're obviously gonna do is we're gonna read in the file name. And then once we do that, we have our handy friend try catch, because we're gonna be opening a new file, so we need to be able to prepare if things go wrong, if the file doesn't exist, things like that. So we have our try catch. And then inside the try, that's where the magic happens. So we're gonna make a new scanner, just like you all are used to. And then we're gonna make a new array list, and this array list is called lines, and it's gonna build up all the lines in this file over time. So when we read all the lines, we're gonna say, well, scanner has next line, we're just gonna add next line to the array list, and then another one, and then another one, and another one. And the array list is just gonna grow to accommodate however many lines we add to this array list. So once we get past this while loop, the array list will have all the lines in it in order, in the same order that they were in, in the file. And now if you wanna reverse it, we are gonna loop from back to front. So we're gonna start with i at lines.size minus one, which is the last index of the line in the array list. We're gonna go all the way up to and including zero, and we're gonna subtract one each time. And then we're gonna print out whatever line is at that index. So we print last one, second to last one, third to last one, fourth to last one, so on and so forth. All right. What questions do you have about the first example? Yes, question. So does the array list have the same sort of index structure as the array index minus one? Yes, so the question is, does it have the same index structure where it's kind of like index minus one? Yes, so anything that's indexed starting at zero, which an array list is, just like an array, 
you have to remember that the last elements index is the length minus one or the size minus one in this case. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so I want to run this really quickly um, just because there is one cool example of a reverse story that I found. So I'm going to uh, do this again. Clips. Okay, so I'm going to jump over and move this down here. So there's this one really cool, um, we won't have time to read through all this thing, but this is one of the stories that I found online. And if you read it in one direction, it's like this really sad story of this father like slowly dying and thinking about his daughter. And then if you read it in the reverse, it's like this happier story about this father thinking about his daughter. So it's really cool. I encourage you to read it after lecture because this will be posted in the lecture materials. Um, but if you kind of read it, you know, it starts off like it was time to go home. It was time to go home, it was time to pull the plug, time to disconnect, blah, blah, blah. If you run reverse story, reverse file, and you enter the file name, which is res no, story.txt. Could not find the file. Oh, wait, hold on. I don't think I got it. So if we do that, you can't really read it, but you can see that even, even the story, if you read the first couple lines, it just starts out as he clasped a pair of hands off his own, a feeling so familiar. So it's a, you know, it tells a completely different story, but it makes sense forwards and backwards. I'm not doing this story justice. It's really cool how it works. There's another one I included called poem.txt. That's a poem that is read in forward and reverse. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. You guys should take a look. All right. Enough, I shouldn't like, I feel like I'm in advertising for these things, but they're so cool. Okay. All right, I'm gonna jump back to my slides. Okay, back to PowerPoint. Okay, so that's our example for reversible writing. Any questions before we move on to our next cool example? We'll talk more about some more advanced ArrayList stuff that you could do. Okay, so we've seen a couple things you can do with ArrayList so far. You can add items and they'll expand. You can get items by index. You can get the size. But as I said before, there are methods that you can call on ArrayList to do even more cool stuff. And some people have touched on those already. Here's a list of a lot of the different things you can do with ArrayList. And you might not use all of these, but I just want to highlight a few. So one of them is there's a version of add that takes one value, and there's a version of add that takes an index and a value, which someone was asking earlier. So if you want to add something in the middle to an array, not ArrayList, not the end, you can do that. Um, you can search for the index of a value, and it will give you back the number index where that value is in your array list. You can check if it's empty. You can remove something by index or by value. So you can say remove the item at index five or remove this string from the array list, which is pretty cool. And then if you just want to replace the value to give an index, you can say set, and there's some other cool stuff as well. And it has a two string, so you don't have to say arrays dot two string. You can just say, you can just print lin your array list variable, and it'll take care of it. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. One note I want to make about adding and slicing in the middle is that if you insert or remove in the front or middle of the list, the elements will shift to accommodate the new size. So it doesn't zero it out. It just removes it and shifts everything else down. So if you add the number 42 at index 2, for example, it's going to slice it in, and everything else to the right of that, the 9 and the 7 and the 5, are going to shift to the right. So it grows to accommodate it. And then similarly, if you say remove 1, so that removes the item at index one, it's gonna cross it off and everything else is gonna shift down. So this is one thing to keep in mind is that the indices for an item are not always the same. You'll notice that the index for the number 42 starts out being index two, now it's index one over here. So things might move around a little bit, you just have to be careful when you remove or add things to an array list that you keep track of the indices appropriately. Okay, so for our second cool example of the day, we are gonna make a program called Planner, which I mentioned earlier. And I think Planner is best shown in demo form. So I'm gonna jump over to Eclipse here. Move my lightsaber. And I'm going to run it first. Not the other one, so run Planner. Make that a little bit bigger. Okay. So let me flip my screen share. This is really meta, like big picture of me over there. Okay. All right, so um, 
Oh, you know what? Ha ha. I took out the code. That's funny. So what I'm going to do is, Marty should remind me to not delete the solution before I start lecturing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump back to the slides here and walk you through the demo instead. And then we'll write the code and then it will work, I promise. Okay, so the way that this works is, it's a, this, is this program lets you very easily manage basically the order in which you want to complete tasks in a given day. So the idea is that it will start off and you'll start off by having the program prompt the user for a bunch of tasks that they want to complete that day. So for example, like obviously the first task on my mind is sleep, right? Everyone just wakes up and you're like, I just want to sleep today. Or maybe I'm the only one that wants to sleep. Um, then I'm going to like, okay, I also need to prepare for lecture. Then I'm going to like play Zelda with Marty. Then I'm going to go for a bike ride maybe. And then I got to walk Daisy because Daisy needs a walk. Um, and so I enter all these tasks and then it's going to, and then when I enter the empty line as a task, it's like, all right, that's all the tasks that you're going to enter. And then it says, okay, now you need to enter the order in which you want to complete them. So what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, here are the tasks that you have remaining today. And it's going to keep prompting me for what task I want to do next until I've set all of them. So it's going to say, here are the tasks left. Which one do you want to do first? And I'm like, okay, well, first I should probably walk Daisy because she's like gets antsy at like 7 a.m. So I'll walk her and then it's like, okay, so now you have this left. And then I'm like, okay, then I'll take a break and play Zelda because like walking Daisy is tiring. Okay, it's like, okay, here's what you have left. Then I'll prepare for lecture. Maybe then I'll go for a bike ride. And then I'm like, okay, I want to decorate my room next. And it's like, uh-uh, that's not on your list. So it does keep track of like, you have to enter the exact tasks that you want to. My room will wait, it'll wait for another day. My room will, it's a little messy, but it'll wait. So it prompts you. And if it detects something that's not in your original list, it'll just be like, nope, stay focused. And then the last one is sleep. And then it's like, okay, cool. Your day's all planned out. And then it will print out the tasks in the order that you want to do. Okay, so basically there are three steps to this. The first step is it prompts the user for a list of tasks of any length, you'll notice can be any size. Then it reprompts the user to enter those tasks in the order they want to complete them. And then it asks, and then it prints out the order that they chose. Okay. So that's the program that we kind of want to tackle here. So it first prompts you for things you want to do today. It asks the user to re-input them and then it outputs the order that they've chosen. So any questions about this program that we're going to tackle together? Question? Okay, so um, what I want to do is have everyone pair up, talk through how you guys think ArrayList could help us here, how you go about solving this problem, thinking about the three steps that we talked about, and then we'll pull back together and we'll try to code it up. Marty, do you want to talk? Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so it sounds like things are quieting down, so let's pull back together. All right, so looking at our three-step process. So the first step, we have kind of a sample output up here. So the first step is we need to prompt the user for a list of tasks, and we need to remember all of them that they entered because later on, we're gonna need to print out this kind of dwindling list of things that they still have left to do. So, who wants to get us started with step one? How do we prompt the user for the tasks that they want to complete today? How would we go about approaching this? For a regular Hershey bar. 
oh, the stakes have been raised. Anyone want to get us started? Yeah, in the back. Awesome, that's a great suggestion. So just to repeat what was said, we have a potential fence post issue here that we've seen before when prompting the user for input. So the idea is that we're gonna prompt the user for input once, because we always know we wanna do it at least once. And then while their input is not empty, we're gonna keep prompting them and what are we gonna do with the input that they enter? And you or anyone, yeah. Anyone else wanna chime in? So they enter a line, what are we gonna do with that, that line or that task that they enter? Anyone? Yeah, add it to the array list. Yeah, exactly. So I'll throw that up there. Okay, there you go. Brady caught it. All right, so you can get one after class because that was also a good suggestion. So we add it to our array list. So for the sake of decomposition, I'm actually going to make a separate method called read tasks. And I'm going to do our reading in, it's kind of this segment, step one, because the steps are kind of a good way to decompose the problem. So I'm gonna put all the code in here. So what we said was we're going to make our new array list. That's the first thing we have to do. So it's gonna be of strings, string called tasks, new array list string. And then what we said we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, string task equals read line, enter task. And then while the task is not an empty string, so the length is greater than zero. That's an easy way to check if it's empty or not. Then we're going to add it to our array list. So we say tasks.add task, and then we're gonna prompt the user for another one. So we're gonna say task equals read line, enter task. Okay, so we have our array list, we build it up with a while loop. Now, it would be nice up here if we could get that value back up. So an easy way to do that is we can just return the array list because array lists are just the type of variable, just like anything else that you can return, you can pass as a parameter, anything you want to do with a regular variable, you can do with an array list. So if we want to say this returns an array list of strings, we can say return tasks. And then up here we have a really nice decomp because we can just say array list string entered tasks equals read tasks. Cool. So we got some nice decomp there. So our first step, one line, we're gonna fill, we're gonna make an array list that's gonna be equal to whatever read tasks gives us back. So read tasks is gonna fill up the array list for us and give it back. So this will have all of the tasks that they've entered. Okay, question, yes. So the question is, it's a great question. So the question is a little bit short. Okay, I'll try again. Yeah. No, still two for, okay, 0 for two. All right, so the question is, is an array list a reference type? And by reference type, you mean if you pass it in as a parameter and they change it in the method, will it change outside of the method? And the answer is yes. Um, so if we, for example, made a new array list out here and passed it as a parameter to read tasks and then read tasks add thing, added things to it, it would be modified in run. So those are two equivalent words. Yes. Okay, so just to test that this works, let's run planner. And you can see that it's already shaping up just like we want. So it says enter task. So if I like walk, actually, maybe we should walk Abby. Is it EY or Y? Right, okay, so we walk Abby. Uh, maybe it's like, okay, now um, Daisy's jealous, so now we're gonna walk Daisy. And then I'm gonna sleep. And then I hit enter, empty line, and then the program finishes. Great, so you can, you, I mean, you, you do or don't have to believe me here, but the array list now has walk Abby, walk Daisy, and sleep. So we filled up our array list with our tasks, and that's step one. Step two is we want to reprompt for the order of tasks. So we want to do this thing where we said, okay, great, now enter the order to complete your tasks, and we want to display all the tasks that are remaining, and then they enter one, and then we remove it from that, and maybe add it to another ordering that we keep, that we keep track of to display later. So any ideas to get us started on step two? Lots to get us started for another off-brand punch bar. That's really bad advertising. I'm sorry, 
Any suggestions to get us started? Yes, in the back. <laughs> okay, so we first have to print out this, which is Portland. Great, and to your tasks. Okay, and then we want to do this, but it looks like we kind of are repeating this a bunch of times where we take tasks remaining, next task. Okay, tasks remaining, next task. So maybe we want to put that in a loop of some kind. Can somebody help me with that? Can I pick on, pick on somebody in the middle section for two off brand crunch bars? I can hit two people for the price of one. Anyone that hasn't chimed in yet? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so one. And, oh, okay, try it again. Two. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. It's okay. Good thing Marty doesn't throw candy during that. She's like, it's okay, Abby. You don't have to be scared. Okay, so exactly. So we can say, hey, we're going to keep asking them for a new task to enter while task is not empty. So while entered tasks is empty. So we're going to say while it's not empty. Right, we can put the not before that. So while there are still tasks left that they have to choose when to do it, we're gonna say, hey, print Lynn, tasks remaining, plus, and then we can just say plus entered tasks, which is pretty cool. And the two string will take care of printing it out for us automatically. So we say tasks remaining, and then we have to get the next task that they wanna do. So we say, hey, string task equals read line, uh, next task to complete, complete. Okay, so we get the task from them. Now, what do we have to do with this task? There's something special here that we have to do. So they enter a task. What are the different cases that we have to deal with? Anyone like Mr. Goodbar? Chocolate and peanuts. Hmm, another off-brand. Any suggestions? Idea? Yeah. Okay, great. So the idea is it would be nice if you could like compare if it's in the array list. And it turns out that, like we talked about before, there are methods on array list that let us do exactly that. So what we want to say is if this is a valid task, so if, if tasks dot contains, we can say, oops, sorry, entered tasks, entered tasks, we can say dot contains our task. So if our task is somewhere in our array list of tasks that they've already entered, we're going to do something. Otherwise, we're going to do something else. And we said here, we want to remove the task. So we can just say um, entered tasks dot remove task. And that will remove it from our array list. And as we said, it'll shift everything else down to make to fill in the space. So it'll be one shorter in length now. Otherwise, we're going to print out our message that's like, that's, that's not on your list. Stay focused. OK, great. So, we have them enter a task one at a time. If it's in our array list, we remove it. Otherwise, we just say, hey, make sure you stay focused here. Now, there's one other thing we have to do when they enter a task that is in our list. And that pertains more to step three. So think about what we might want to do in step three and how we might need to modify this to get there. Yes. Okay, so the question or the suggestion is maybe we can make another array list to keep track of the things that they've entered in order, right? And that's exactly what we want to do because we need to keep track of this new ordering. We could try to maybe finagle the enter tasks and move the order around, but it's easier to just say, hey, make a new array list. And I'm actually going to do it under step two. So let's make another array list called ordered tasks. A uh, new array of strings. So we're going to make a new empty one, and we're going to build this one up with the same tasks, but in the correct order that the user wants. So in this case, when it contains the task, we're going to remove it from our enter task, and we're just going to kind of move it over to the ordered ones. So we're going to say ordered tasks dot add task. Okay, so when they enter one that's in our list of tasks, we're going to pull it out of that one, just pull it out, and put it in the new one in order. So if we add it to the back, then the next one will be added to the back, and the next one will be added to the back. So it'll add it in the order that the user entered. Okay, so let's give this a shot. 
So we have enter tasks. So I'm just going to say walk Abby and walk Daisy just to test it. And then I hit enter. Now it's like, great, enter the order to complete your tasks. And it lists all the tasks we have. So now I'm going to say, you know, it's like, sorry, Abby, but I, I like Daisy. So I'm going to walk Daisy first. Okay. And it's like, cool. It detected that and it removed it from our array list. And now we have walk Abby left. And now when we hit enter, it should stop, which it does because our array list of tasks is now empty. All right, last step. Step three, this is the easy part. How do we print out our new task order? One liner for a dark chocolate Hershey's. I'm starting to get hungry. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to use the two string method. Nope, that didn't even work. All right, come get it after class, that's fine. So we can say print land, and actually remember the fun fact about a two string is that if you just put the array list in, everyone's just like getting hit by Hershey bars. So if you just say print lin ordered tasks, we don't actually have to call the two string method ourselves because if we just say print lin and then the array list, it will know like, hey, in order to print this, I need to call the two string method on ordered tasks. So we can just say print lin ordered tasks and that'll print out our list. So once more for fun, enter task, walk Abby, walk Daisy, sleep, and then maybe play some Zelda with Marty. All right, that's it. Great, enter the order in which you want to do it. Well, actually, you know, I'm going to play Zelda first because I haven't played that in a while. Then maybe I'll walk Abby. Um, then I'm going to go for a run. Nope, that's not on my list. So it's going to reprompt me. Sorry, exercise. You have to wait. And then I'll say, hey, maybe I'll walk Daisy. And then I'll sleep. And it's like, hey, look, there's our order. So play Zelda, walk Abby, walk Daisy. No, not going for a run. That wasn't added to our list. And then sleep. All right, cool. Any questions about this example? Pretty cool. All right, so I wanna jump back to the slides in the last couple of minutes we have to talk about one last thing. Okay, so that was our example for planner. So just a couple highlights to give you some takeaways from this. So just keep in mind the reason that array lists are useful here is because we needed to keep track of all of the input the user entered, regardless of how many lines they entered. And we needed to build up that, that list over time. So that's why an array list is handy here because we needed to build up and store the entire list of tasks that the user entered and then do something with all of those tasks, not just one of them. It's not like we can keep a running tally of what's the highest number the user has entered so far. We need to remember everything the user has entered. And that's why array lists are useful. Okay, so. A quick comparison of array lists versus arrays. So you might be thinking like, hey, array lists are pretty awesome. Why would we ever want to use arrays, which was asked a little bit earlier. There's one downside, which is that array lists and primitives don't get along super well. And by primitive, I mean anything that's not an object. So int, double, boolean, car, things like that. So array lists can only store objects. And an object is anything as a reminder, anything that you make by using the new keyword. So when you make a grect, a goval, uh, G line strings are also objects. Those are special case, but anything in general that you use the new keyword with array lists can store, but they can't store primitives. And this is just a limitation of array lists as they were designed originally. And it's kind of a bummer. So they came back around and the people who made array lists were like, you know, maybe we can make this a little bit better. So they came up with this awesome solution that solves everything and makes array lists immaculately well designed. And I'm not being sarcastic at all. It's a pretty crummy solution. Let me show you. So what they did was they said, okay, we can't store ints, doubles, booleans, or cars. So let's make a class for each of those. That's the object version of ints, booleans, doubles, and cars. And then you can put those in an array list instead. And you're like, you have to be kidding me. And I'm like, I wish I was kidding you, but I'm not. So these are called wrapper classes. So what they did was they made a new type of object. Everyone's laughing. You're like, this is ridiculous. You guys could have designed something better. So they made a new class for every one of the primitives that's an object version of all of these. So ints is capital I integer, double is capital D double, boolean is capital D boolean. So you notice that if you're in like a conversation and if you're like talking about this with someone at a party, which you will probably do never, um, I don't know, depending on what kind of parties you go to, you could, it's, it's always hard to read this because you're like, oh yeah, I use doubles and you're like capital D doubles or lowercase d doubles and it just, it gets out of hand. So, you know, and then they like walk away because they're not interested in talking to you and it's a bad time. So proper classes are kind of sucky solution. The good news is that you don't really have to worry about these besides just knowing that they're there. So what I mean by that is when you make a new array list and you want it to store numbers like integers, you just say array list integer list equals new array list integer. 
But what's cool is that Java has pity on you and it says, hey, if you make a new array list of integers, but you add an int to it, I know what you mean. Like, it's fine. You don't have, you know, I'll, I'll cut you some slack here. Like, it's all good. So if you add an int, it converts back and forth automatically. Similarly, when you get a number out of your array list of integers and you say get the first number and you store it in an int, Java is also going to cut you some slack. It's be like, you know what, it's fine. I know what you mean. Like, they're, you know, they're interchangeable. So I'll give it back to you as an int. So it does this for all of these wrapper classes. And the point is that you really only need to worry that these wrapper classes exist when you make your array list. You can't say array list int. You have to say array list integer. So otherwise, Java converts back and forth automatically. You never have to create capital D doubles or capital I integers, all that stuff. You don't have to worry about it. But it's there, and you should know it's there. That's how it's working underneath that. OK, any questions about wrappers? Yes. This is a real life thing. <laughs> the people at Stanford were like, ah, oh, this is bad. OK. So the last thing I want to do is just a quick recap of arrays versus array lists and how far we've come. So array lists, you make them like this. You put the type in angle brackets versus arrays. You put the type before square brackets. You have to specify the size for an array. For an array list, you don't. Array lists start off empty. When you want to add an item to an array list, you just say add, and the size will grow or shrink accordingly. When you want to add an item to an array, you use the bracket notation with index. But notice that we can't expand or contract the size of the array. It's always fixed. And then when we want to set elements or change things in an array or an array list, we say set. This puts a 3 at index 0. That's how we do it with an array, 3 at index 0. And if we want to get an item at an index, we say get 0, and we put it in an int, and we do that the same. So there's a lot of syntactic and functional similarities between arrays and array lists. But remember that there's no equivalent for an array for things like adding and expanding the size or checking if it contains. So a short summary is why you would use these is arrays are kind of more native to Java. So you'll notice that the syntax for arrays is more concise and nice to write versus array lists is more verbose. But the nice thing is that because you initialize an array with a static size, it's better for things where you know the size in advance. If you always know you want 10 numbers or 10 slots, an array is better because for an array list, you have to manually build up 10 slots in the array list to grow it to size 10. Okay, so there are some cases where arrays are more useful. All right. So as a really quick recap, array lists, they're just a variable containing a list of items, just like arrays that you're used to. The differences between arrays and array lists that array lists are better at is they can resize dynamically, and they have useful methods like contains, index of, remove, all that cool stuff that you can call on them. And arrays can store any item, not just objects. That's the main limitation of array lists. Um, but they're still pretty cool. All right. Hope you all have a good weekend. Come drop by if you have any questions or if you want to say hi to Abby.